ミステリーハンターハンドクハロー、ディスイットハンドクン。アンドコタロー。ドンユーシンクザックロセスエンドモストミステリアスビングインディスワールドアズウィリフイッヒューマンアンドアワセルフツ。ウィヒューマンスハビンリビングウィザワウマインズ、ブレインズエンドボディズエバシンズウィワボーン。バウィハフトワンダーワウィアー、ワウィシュッドゥ、エンドワウィワボーンツドゥ。エンドハウキャンアイコントロールマイセルフツァウェイアイワンツ。アイリブマイライフコンフューズエンドウォリーズアバウトノウィンディスミステリー。オフコースアイドンシンクイヴ Geniuses like Einstein or Nikola Tesla could understand all of this. Today, I would like to once again unravel the mysteries hidden within humans and the hidden powers within us and find hints for creating a good life. Today, I want to talk about three main topics flow, lucid dreaming, and the pineal gland. First, a question for you all How much of your potential do you think you're currently using? Imagine how great you could be if you could perfectly control yourself and fully utilize your abilities. If we could control ourselves perfectly, then by now you wouldn't have any unfinished tasks or unmet goals from last year, right? Ideally, we should all be steadily growing every year. However, it's likely that 99% of people aren't doing this. There's an urban myth. That humans only use about 10% of their brains. But from a neuroscientific standpoint, that's incorrect. There are no useless parts in the human brain. Everything is used for our survival. So, to put it accurately, although every person has a brain capable of being 100% utilized, many either misuse it or don't realize its full potential, resulting in only 10% or 20% of brain performance being exploited. It is said. That some people can consciously tap into nearly 100% of their latent energy, while others are unable to harness their potential at all. Flow. Top athletes, for example, clearly perform better in critical moments, whether it's a pinch or a chance. And it's said that in any profession, whether you're a chess player, a business executive, a doctor, an artist, an engineer, Or a chef, those who have mastered their field share something in common an extraordinary state of concentration known as flow. This was present when Einstein unraveled the theory of relativity and when Sam Altman developed ChatGPT. It's like using a boost mode in a video game where your power or speed temporarily increases and your focus narrows down to a single point, making time and even your sense of self disappear. Merging you with the world. This state is called flow. It's not a special ability only geniuses possess, but rather a capability inherent in all living beings, not just humans. Have you ever experienced this state of flow? Many of you might have felt it while playing sports, gaming, or engaging in artistic activities. If you're still unfamiliar with this sensation, Finding out how to remove your own limiters or discovering triggers that allow you to do so can undoubtedly enable you to maximize your potential and live the life you desire. Today, I want to talk about how to achieve this. Flow means a smooth progression, and many who have experienced this state liken it to the natural flow of water, which is why it's called this. Just as a chess pro can see the entire flow of the game with each move, or a rock climber knows exactly which crevice to grasp to reach the top, they are fully aware of what they need to do in each moment, feeling as if time itself has stopped. This isn't something extraordinary. When you're deeply focused on something you enjoy, your sense of time distorts. Compare how time feels when you're doing your nails to when you're in a crowded train. Many people in a state of flow. Report hours feeling like minutes. Basketball players, for example, might say the hoop feels as big as a hula hoop. Even though time and space haven't changed from an outsider's perspective, the human brain can distort them through concentration. When someone is in this state, their face might look so intensely focused that they appear angry with furrowed brows. But those wrinkles are a sign that your brain is working at full capacity. I want to talk about specific ways to unlock 100% of human potential. Surprisingly, the term flow was first used by the writer Goethe, who described a state overflowing with joy. Later, 
Nietzsche also wrote about flow. And then in the 1970s, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, a psychologist from Hungary, laid the foundations of flow psychology and positive psychology. He's known as the godfather of flow psychology. He was interested in happiness and the meaning of life for humans. And he asked people around the world about their best moments in life and when they performed at their best. Everywhere, people said the same thing. At that time, I entered an altered state of consciousness and all my actions and decisions felt perfectly smooth and flowed effortlessly to completion. To put it in more relatable terms, it's like being so engrossed in something that you feel like you're actually in a dream. To enter this state, there's a certain golden ratio of challenge to skill, which we call the flow's golden ratio. This is illustrated in the following diagram. It's said that we can focus best on a task when it slightly exceeds our skills. Flow happens when a climber looks at a mountain and thinks they need to use all their strength to climb it, or when a singer feels they have to push their vocal skills and range to their limits to perform a song properly. Imagine this, when you're solving an easy problem, you feel unmotivated, and if it's too difficult, you become anxious and worried. Also, continuously tackling tasks that are exactly at your level can be quite boring. When you enter flow, you lose the capacity to worry about uncertainties or inappropriate emotions, leading to the disappearance of self-consciousness, but you might feel stronger than usual. You also experience a sense of your mind and body expanding in all directions and harmonizing, which leads to a positive feeling about being alive. Please look at this diagram a bit more. States like arousal and control are also positive. However, arousal can mean you're working hard without enough control or relaxation, a time when higher skills are said to be developed. The control state is good, but lacks focus and immersion so it's suggested to increase the level of challenge at that time. So, from here, I want to tell you about the triggers for flow that all humans have, to help you actually experience the state of flow. There are about 20 of these triggers identified so far. While some people may have their unique triggers, the common ones identified by current research include dopamine, unpredictability, perfect focus, complexity, or pattern recognition, and taking risks. Just being aware of some of these in your daily life can change it, so I encourage you to try them out. The first key is perfect focus. When you're working, deciding when and where to start is crucial. Some people concentrate better in the early morning, while others find their focus late at night when the city is quiet. Knowing when you can focus best and creating that environment is the most basic approach. To do this, you need to figure out whether you're a morning person or a night owl. Research has shown that this is largely determined by genetics, and changing from one to the other is considered impossible with current scientific knowledge. However, you won't know for sure without trying both. Some people who think they're night owls might actually be morning people. If you're unsure, why not try becoming a morning person? If you're serious about concentrating, it's better to turn off your smartphone, TV, and notifications from Twitter or Instagram. It's said that 80% of people check their phone within 15 minutes of waking up. These are called flow blockers. Removing anything that inhibits flow is crucial. Even if you manage to enter a state of flow, distractions like phone calls, notifications, or knocks on the door can scatter your focus, and it might take another 15 minutes to get back into it. Flow is like a stream, so anything that disrupts it is a flow blocker. Ideally, not touching your phone for about two hours after waking up is best, but this can be very challenging in modern life. If you're interested, give it a try. Next, let's talk about dopamine. Dopamine is a very important neurotransmitter for entering the state of flow. It's involved in human happiness, pleasure and motivation. There are various ways to release dopamine from the brain, but novelty is said to be the most significant factor. When you encounter something new, such as visiting a place for the first time, seeing something for the first time, or experiencing something for the first time, your brain releases a lot of dopamine. So, start trying new things from now on. By doing so, dopamine will naturally be released, 
making your life more enjoyable and increasing your happiness. And then there's unpredictability, creating a state where you don't know what will happen next. There's nothing more boring than doing the same thing over and over every day. If you keep doing that, you'll end up at the end of the year saying something like an old man. Wow, this year flew by so fast. And then there's complexity. The more complex a maze or a game is, the more likely it is that people will become engrossed in it. And then there's awe. When you touch the grandeur of nature, or when you see a sky full of stars at night, your brain grasps the magnitude of the world, the universe, from the splendor of nature and the brightness of those stars, and your perception momentarily expands. Encountering things beyond human power can unlock your brain's limiters. Please give it a try. Next is pattern recognition. Think about when you're solving crossword puzzles. When you make progress in the puzzle, your brain releases pleasure chemicals, right? That's dopamine. Solving puzzles like that, one after another, strengthens pattern recognition. As your brain recognizes these patterns, this isn't just about repeating the same thing, but about stacking up small successes. If you find pleasure in these successes, your brain will automatically guide you towards achieving your goals. And a very important thing is taking risks. Humans are fundamentally creatures who prefer not to take risks. There are various kinds of risks, including physical risks like bungee jumping, emotional risks, social risks, and intellectual risks. I understand the natural feeling of wanting to avoid risks if possible. However, it is said to be essential for maintaining motivation to incorporate a certain level of risk in our lives and activities. Next is intrinsic motivation. Motivation is about the reason why you do something. Every action you take has a reason behind it, which should be deeply connected to your motivation. It is said that human motivation can be categorized into five types. The first one is curiosity. If you are very interested in something, you don't need a strong will to engage in it, right? Humans can do things they are interested in without much effort. The second one is passion. Imagine being in love and liking someone. Your mind is filled with thoughts of that person and all your attention is directed towards them. Even if you try not to think about them, you can't help it. Passion is a way to obtain such powerful concentration for free. The third one is purpose. Do you have a purpose in life? Is it for yourself, for society, or for the world? In fact, goals, even if they are altruistic, such as world peace, have a very selfish effect on one's consciousness. Therefore, great and outstanding people always act with a high sense of purpose that far exceeds the imagination of ordinary people, because they know it energizes them. The fourth one is independence. Independence can also be called freedom. Beyond curiosity, passion and purpose, we need the independence to integrate them. This can also be described as a feeling of being in control of your own life. In order to achieve your goals, you want freedom. So you need to obtain that freedom. Find what you want to do and do it. This is something I recently discovered and I realized that so many people think that doing what they like is selfish. But if doing what you want means being selfish, I think it's better to be selfish. The fifth and final stage is mastery. This is about skill acquisition. You have the skills necessary to pursue your goals. You will need to perform at your best in order to achieve your goals. Therefore, maintain your motivation, learn various things, and demonstrate your creativity in various places. And what emerges is mastery. We've talked about a lot of things, but what will happen if we become conscious of these things? It means you have a flow constitution. This means that your body, mind and brain are always ready to enter a flow state. Lucid Dream Now we're entering a story that sounds like an urban legend. Dreams, one of the greatest mysteries of human existence, are intriguing. Have you heard of lucid dreams? What I've recently noticed is that when I ask people if they've ever had a dream where they realize they're dreaming and can control it, it seems more people have had lucid dreams now than in the past. A few years ago, when you mentioned lucid dreaming, most people were puzzled by the term. 
but today, it feels like most people have heard of it and have experienced it. I wonder how many of you have also had dreams that you were able to control. Why do all living beings, including humans, need sleep, despite it seeming disadvantageous for survival? Humanity hasn't fully figured it out yet. We also don't fully understand why we dream. However, research by neuroscientists like Paul Shaw from Washington University has shed some light. Surprisingly, it suggests that being asleep is the natural state for living beings, and being awake came much later in evolution. So, the question, why do we sleep, might be backward. Sleeping is the basic state of life, and over time, evolving to wakefulness became possible. Doesn't this make you wonder why humans have the ability to dream? Now let's look at how to have lucid dreams. There's a deep connection between sleep duration and lucid dreaming. During the pandemic, when people spent more time at home, it was found that more people around the world were dreaming. In fact, the longer someone sleeps, the more they dream. Those who dream more often can remember more dreams, and people who remember their dreams are more likely to experience lucid dreams. A study in Germany found that 2.65% of people have lucid dreams several times a week, form 46% about once a week, 7.79% two to three times a month, and 9.84% about once a month. This means that one in four people frequently have lucid dreams. Interestingly, 41.19% of people say they have never had a lucid dream. So it's not uncommon for people to frequently have lucid dreams or to never have them at all. But what kind of people are more likely to have lucid dreams? There's actually research on the relationship between lucid dreaming and the big five personality traits, a psychological category that divides personality into five factors. Among these, the trait most associated with lucid dreaming is said to be openness. On the other hand, individuals with high levels of conscientiousness tend to remember lucid dreams less frequently. This might be because their conscientious nature applies breaks even in dreams, limiting their freedom of action. Of course, being conscientious is important. However, from the perspective of lucid dreaming, it's said that people who are open to new challenges have rich imaginations, possess a strong sense of aesthetics, and come up with unconventional ideas are more likely to experience lucid dreams. Indeed, it has long been said that many artists are long sleepers. Surprisingly, Albert Einstein is also famously known as a long sleeper, requiring about 10 hours of sleep each day. In dreams, the brain can combine past memories to immerse itself in original worlds, suggesting a deep connection between dreams and creativity. Additionally, individuals with neurotic tendencies are said to be more prone to lucid dreaming. These are people who tend to worry about even the minor details. They are more likely to realize they are dreaming, which may facilitate lucid dreaming. One might think that being neurotic only leads to nightmares. However, research from Austria has found that people who frequently experience lucid dreams often look forward to dreaming each night. They have a positive attitude towards dreams, higher stress coping abilities, and greater overall happiness. Thus, effectively utilizing dreams can not only enhance creativity, but also improve metacognitive abilities in daily life, boost self-confidence, and increase happiness. Perhaps with further practice, you might even develop the ability to see slightly into the future, like a prophet, or maybe not. Let me introduce some training techniques for experiencing lucid dreams. As mentioned earlier, openness is a crucial trait for lucid dreaming. To facilitate reproducing your sensory experiences within dreams, it's beneficial to sharpen your senses in daily life. Essentially, you should become more attuned to your surroundings such as the landscape, sounds, and even the colors of clothes people wear, the arrangement of items in a store, or the scent of the air, treating these observations as rehearsals for your dreams. Paying attention to and inputting these various details into your consciousness can be incredibly helpful. Additionally, sitting in a cafe and letting your mind wander, indulging in fantasies and daydreams, can also nurture your imagination. The environment in which you wake up is also important for lucid dreaming. It's not good to wake up to too loud sounds from your alarm clock or smartphone. So, if you want to have a lucid dream today, set your alarm to a lower volume than usual. And the most important thing is that before you go to sleep, 
You need to have a strong desire to have a lucid dream or some kind of dream today. Are feelings the most important thing? You may think so, but the stronger your desire to lucid dream, the easier it will be to have a lucid dream. A more specialized method is the mild method, which was devised by Dr. Stephen LeBurge. In the movie Inception, there was a scene in which the main character spins a top to check whether the current moment is real or not. Just like that, several times a day you ask yourself, is this moment a dream or reality? Then, if you pinch yourself and it hurts, it's reality. Or if you check the hands of the clock, if it's going at the same speed as usual, it's reality. And if the hands stop, it's a dream. Decide on a dream sign like this and check it once in a while. Then, even when you are actually asleep and dreaming, dream signs will appear and by checking them, you can confirm that it is a dream. Or maybe some people have dreams, but the story ends up being the same every time. I think that such people always know in their dreams what will happen after this dream. But when you think like that, try taking a different action than usual. If what you always have is a dream of flying in the sky, just changing the way you fly may change how you end up. Also, this is very famous but it is said that recording the contents of your dreams is also effective. If you have time, keep a pen and paper next to your bed and write down fragments of your dreams so you can remember them later. It is also said that it becomes easier to dream of the same situation as that dream. In this way, if you can make sleep your friend, the quality of your life will greatly improve. Pineal gland. Lastly, when we talk about bringing out 100% of human potential, we will talk about DMT and the pineal gland. This is a rather off-topic topic, but do you know about the chemical substance called DMT? This is a substance called dimethyltryptamine, also known as the spirit molecule. If you ask me that, it sounds like a pretty dangerous substance. However, they basically exist in all human bodies and are tissue components that are also included in non-human mammals, marine animals, grasses, beans, frogs, mushrooms, flowers, etc. DMT is common in nature. It is said that an immeasurably important secret about humanity is hidden in DMT, the human mind, and the hallucinations caused by DMT. DMT is a substance closely related to hallucinations and is also secreted by the human brain. Another method is to secrete DMT by taking it into the body by drinking certain liquids. In Peru, shamans have traditionally used the plant ayahuasca and drank the liquid during rituals. Ayahuasca is a national cultural heritage of Peru. This substance called DMT is secreted from the pineal gland in our brains, but the question is why the brain secretes a substance that has hallucinogenic effects for humans. This answer has not yet been found. Phenomena caused by DMT are said to include out-of-body experiences, predictions of the future, conversations with deceased people, and conversations with God and aliens. It is known that DMT is secreted from the brain in many cases where humans have mystical experiences. However, since around the 1970s, due to the worldwide popularity of hallucinogens such as LSD, research on hallucinogens has become taboo. However, 50 years later, attention is once again being paid to what DMT does in the body. Even now, most people are of the opinion that DMT is not something that humans can handle yet. And I personally don't think humans should be able to easily come into contact with the molecules of the spirit. There is a brain organ within us that has the role of connecting DMT and the human body. That is the pineal gland. The pineal gland was first described in human history in a medical book written by a Greek doctor named Herophilus in the 3rd century BC. It is called the pineal gland because it looks very similar to a pine cone. In urban legends, the pineal gland is often referred to as the third eye, and it is said that the Egyptian eye of Horus refers to the pineal gland. It is said that ancient people had a more active pineal gland than modern people, and that they were able to communicate with gods and aliens through the pineal gland, and were able to build an advanced civilization. The most interesting thing is that the pineal gland exists as a single unit in our brains. In the human body, the eyes, ears, and limbs are symmetrical, 
and the brain is divided into right and left hemispheres, so all tissues are symmetrical. However, the pineal gland was the only unpaired organ that existed, and for a long time, no one knew its functions. In the 17th century, the philosopher Descartes was searching for the source of human thought, and intuitively imagined that the pineal gland was the core of human consciousness. Since then, it has become mainstream in the spiritual world to believe that the pineal gland is the location of the human soul. According to one theory, if the human brain is compared to a computer, DMT secreted from the pineal gland is equivalent to the silicon part of the computer and the part that mediates the electrical circuit of the CPU. It is said that DMT is the substance that mediates what we call consciousness or soul, which science has not yet elucidated. And one more thing, this is just a hypothesis, but when the switch is turned on for the fetus to become a living being, that is, at the moment when life energy flows into the fetus, the pineal gland releases DMT, which activates the switch for life. This is because, for every human being, from birth to death, there are three moments when large amounts of DMT are released from the brain. These are birth, dying, and death. It is said that many people have spiritual experiences when they are born, when they die, and when they are very close to death. It is known that large amounts of DMT are released from the brain at that time. In other words, DMT is the key substance to all spiritual experiences. When we look at the structure of the human brain, we find that the pineal gland is located in the deepest part of the brain and is the most protected part of the brain. The brain is the part of the body that humans need to protect the most, which is why our skulls are so thick. The fact that it is located in the deepest part of the brain means that it is the area that needs to be protected the most. If the pineal gland is the source of human consciousness, it is no surprise that it is the most protected. It has also been said that the brain is the receiver of reality. What we see when we are awake is reality. What we see when we are asleep is a dream. And what we see, even though it does not exist, is hallucination. Dreams that occur when you are awake are daydreams. We distinguish between ambiguous things like that. However, what is real and what is not real is just what we believe. And everything is just information that our brains are receiving. Among these, the one that is considered particularly ambiguous is the mystical experience. I think mystical experiences a part of human history itself. As history tells us, the birth of religion, meditation, and reverence for God and nature are inseparable from human history. However, these are more than just mystical experiences. They are something different from the physical reality that we know, and they are stories about a world that exists on the other side of the real world. It is said that if humans can master these three elements, they will be able to unleash all of their hidden abilities. I believe that if you can master some, if not all of them, your life will be even better than it is now. There are many mysteries about the pineal gland. It makes people hallucinate. But I realized that it is definitely necessary for humans. Physically speaking, I think humans are given the pineal gland and the DMT as devices that mediate when we come into contact with a world that exists in a different dimension. Otherwise, we wouldn't understand why there is a function deep within the brain that allows us to simply see hallucinations. I also personally think that there is a connection between lucid dreaming and DMT. Does this mean that in order to unlock our human potential, we need to maintain a full state, sleep well, have lucid dreams, and activate the pineal gland? This channel has become quite popular recently with over 10 subscribers, and I want to grow it even further, so I have to unleash my potential. I think that perhaps in a few more years or decades, research will elucidate what DMT is. It could change the world to another channel. It could allow us to access a spiritual world that we once believed to be a hallucination. And it could allow humanity to experience encounters with the unknown. At that time, I hope everyone will remember this video.
By the way, research on spontaneous encounters with aliens has shown that people are more likely to encounter aliens when they are experiencing a personal crisis, trauma, or major event in their private lives. When humans experience extreme stress or pain, DMT is released from the pineal gland. As I mentioned earlier, it is said that when this exceeds a certain level, the door to meeting alien may open. If any of you have ever looked back and realized that DMT must have been coming out of your brain, please let us know in the comment section. Also, please subscribe to our channel and give it a good review. See you next time. Bye bye. bye. bye.